Assalamu alaikum and welcome to part 7 from the magic and evil eye and envy that a lot of Muslims are scared of belief in and as I said earlier on our Islamic institution has put a condition if you do not believe that the messenger of Allah was ensorcelled was bewitched someone has done some witchcraft against if you don't believe that then you cannot be a Muslim and I tell them with the fullest mouth that I can get and the loudest mouth that I can get I do not believe for a split of a second that somebody as uh, they say a Jewish man would take a comb with the hair of the messenger and male uh, seed of a, a palm tree throws them in a well and then uh, would summon up some evil spirit to come and put a spell on a messenger of Allah until uh, between 40 to six, uh, 40 days to 6 months the messenger of Allah would do things and he doesn't recall would sleep, would eat, would read Quran, would perform every single task of the day and he has no clue if he has or he hasn't and then they tell me you got to believe in that and when I tell them how about the Quran he receives they say oh when he receives the Quran Allah stops the sahar stops magic this is a ridiculous joke that they have invented about Allah's religion Allah would stop the magic just when he receives the Quran and as soon as the Quran gets finished the magic is back doesn't this messenger recite Quran and then they tell you when Allah wanted to cure him he sent two angels and they came and they had all this conversation one of the head and the other one of the toe and in other narrations they say they started reading on him قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ this is the whole surah and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ the whole surah and they came down for the very first time with these two surahs but they lie because the magic happened at the latest parts of the life of the messenger and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ were revealed in Mecca so if these two surahs were revealed in Mecca and the Prophet used to pray with them in Fajr and uh, in Maghrib recite them and after each Salat how did this Jewish man manage to ensorcel our messenger when there is no such thing as magic the problems we have in our Islam are so deep and so hard to you you cannot get your head around i am not a muslim if i do not believe that the messenger of allah has been a victim to sorcery i do not believe this and they tell you you are not a muslim if you do not believe a 45 years old man would sexually sleep with a girl of nine years old because he's her husband it doesn't work like that. I don't believe this is split of a second, even if the entire hadith community and every book reports this hadith. I do not believe it. I don't. How come a 50? And then when you tell them, they say, oh, come on. At the time of the Arabs, that was a normal thing to do. And I'll tell you, that place was a pedophilia moment because Saudi Arabia is still as hot as it was 1,500 years ago the Arabian Peninsula is as hot as it always been Africa is as hot as it always been and I don't see girls of nine years of old behaving like a woman of 18 or 19 years of age I don't see that until now and it's not uh, documented that the Arabs used to marry girls of six seven eight what kind of a man would oh, it's, it's, it makes my body shiver a man of almost she was six the prophet muhammad was 51 and he becomes her husband is this a prophet is this a messenger and then at 54 he would sexually sleep with his wife of nine nine and in the hadith she said when the messenger when i went to live these are in our books of hadith that they want us to believe in they say Aisha said that when she got married to the messenger and when she went to his home to live with him as his wife six seven eight years she said I had my dolls with me yes she had her dolls with her even so one day he asked her what's that 
She goes, what? He goes, that thing there that has wings. She goes, oh, this, are the, this is the horse of Suleiman. Don't you know that he has wings? And he smiled and he laughed. Why? Because she was a little girl praying with a doll. In another hadith that they report that the messenger of Allah, Aisha, was playing with the girls. They were playing kitchen and house and you know how girls play, family and, and with dolls. And the messenger of Allah was there just smiling. What kind of pervert is this man? But the messenger of Allah, they insist, you are not a Muslim if you don't believe in this. Guess what? I ain't believing in it. I do not believe in it. And I do not believe that the messenger was insulted. Sad, but that's what's happening. The story of Harut and Marut in Babylonian times. And why would Allah bring that in the Quran for the children of Israel? The rabbis and the leaders of the three tribes that existed at the, at the time of Rasulullah in al Madina, why did they divert the attention of their people from the Torah and the Quran and link them to what has been given to Sulaiman? What has made Allah establish the fact that Sulaiman did not disbelieve, but the shayateen, i.e. the leaders, the people who say, who are invented the stories about his kingdom, are the liars. Well, guess that's what we're going to be discussing in this uh, hour here, the seventh hour of this talk. As always, the context is the only one that decides the meaning of what Allah wants in the Quran. Because when Allah sent down this Quran, he made it in an easy way for us humans to understand his intent. What does he intend when we say what he says? And one of the biggest errors of the men of religion, those big shot sheikhs, one thing that they committed throughout the long centuries of Al-Islam, and oftentimes when they do that, it leads them to grave conclusions which have affected and turned into uh, our lives into a huge big misery. Really it is, we live in a misery. No matter how much you do, you are not guaranteed that you're going to go to paradise. And that's, that's the sad thing. And they have rubbed their understanding on the story of Harut and Marut, and they didn't let the context of Allah decide. And sadly, what was said about Suleiman and the kingdom that Allah granted him went completely in the opposite direction of what Allah wanted from them. The men of religion extracted parts of the ayah, of this ayah, and then they used it for different other topics. The ayah that you're going to be discussing today about also the, the two uh, angels, as they say, Harut and Marut, has been used as an evidence to prove that magic exists since Allah in it says that they learn from them what they can use to separate a man from his wife and that's why they say oh sihr exists so let me now take you in a beautiful journey into a story about one of the great kings that have graced earth Suleiman and his story of the kingdom and the devils of the children of Israel. When I say the devils from the children of Israel, I mean the rabbis and anyone in a position of power and leadership that has worked hard to deviate and turn away the children of Israel from what is good for them, i.e. the Quran or the Torah or the Torah. The ayah that Allah mentioned was nothing to prove that the magic exists, when in fact it was to respond to a very particular behavior of the children of Israel, and specifically their religious leaders. This story took place at the time of Muhammad, at the time of Rasulullah. Allah has clearly documented this, uh, this particular behavior and mentioned it down in the Quran. And we're going to start by saying when Allah said, وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And when a messenger, Muhammad, came to them, to the children of Israel, from Allah, because the Quran has a message also for the children of Israel. مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَهُمْ 
affirming or corroborating what is with them. You see, the Torah has so many things that the Quran supports, like whatever is going to happen in Judgment Day, who is the believer, who is not the believer. For example, magic is haram in the Torah, and I will mention the text in a little bit later on. Uh, fornicating, stealing, mal, and all these evil things that Allah doesn't want exist in the Torah. So when the Quran came, it didn't bring a new country to what they got. As a matter of fact, the whatever law in the Quran is what they have, even simplified and easier. So when the Quran came to them, the rabbis and the leaders knew exactly and very well exactly knew what is inside the Quran. And that is why they decided to reject it. نبذ فريق من الذين أوتوا الكتاب كتاب الله ورأضهم a team of those who were given the book the Torah speaking of the Jews through the book of Allah the Torah behind their backs and they did that as if they didn't know what is inside that Torah and this statement was made by Allah because the Torah contained the message of Jesus in which he stated that a messenger shall come after me. And they knew when Muhammad came and he brought the Quran, they knew that the Quran wasn't written by Muhammad but a revealed book from Allah. Especially that they have the Torah and they know how Allah talks. But the leaders of the children of Israel, the tribes at the time of Rasulullah, were, even though they were aware of this, they deliberately ignored both what Jesus has said about the messenger to come, and they also deliberately threw away the teachings of the Torah behind their backs. Teachings that forbid magic, forbid sorcery, forbid so many things, as I said, I will mention them in a little bit. And why did they do all that? Well, the simple that they did that is just so that they don't let and they do not allow the Jews at their time the possibility that they might become Muslims. So what they did, they occupied them with a fascinating topic, the kingdom of Suleiman. The, string, the strangest thing is, something that is very strange, this fascinating topic of Suleiman still occupies the Jews to our times and the excavations that excavations that are happening now in Jerusalem are in search for the kingdom of Suleiman. It's incredible. And also so for us to know the impact of what the rabbi had done or what they have invented on Suleiman and his kingdom all you need to do is just do something simple. Go on the internet and type why is Solomon important in the Bible, of course. And you will get the following few answers. They will tell you Suleiman or Solomon is known for being the king of Israel. Not David, not Dawood, not his father, but him. And when they say the star of David, remember, it's, the, uh, the, it's uh, far more the star of Solomon and his uh, uh, ring by now. And then they tell you, he, he, Suleiman is the first king to have built the temple for Jerusalem. That temple is what the Jews today in 2022 want to build in Palestine or Israel, whatever, uh, or whatever how you want to look at it, on that blessed land in Jerusalem. And the whole conflict is about that. The Jews, they say, we have a right to believe it, to build it there. Suleiman built it there. And then come the Muslims, us, who invaded the land and occupied it and then turned it ours and for centuries lied to the world that it is ours when in fact it's not ours. Allah has given it to the Jews. But that's politics for you. And so much so that the Palestinians today, <laughs> it always amuses me this part. Palestinians who came from foreign lands to live in the blessed land that belonged to the Jews today claim that Jewish people are occupiers of Jerusalem and Palestine. And I, and I scratch my head when I talk to people. I say, don't you, don't you read the Quran? Don't you know? Where was Musa, not Musa, when was Suleiman, Dawood, all the prophets, Jesus, Yahya, Zachariah, the story of Miriam when she gave birth to her child? What did that happen? 
It happened in the blessed land, what we call today Palestine. How is that a people that lived there and Allah gave it to them in the Quran? And I'm not talking about the, how, how can they become occupiers? But that is the produce of politics and 15 centuries of brainwashing for the Muslims. Carry on. They said Suleiman made Israel at the highest of its power. And in his reign, Suleiman dominated the world. After all, he brought the Queen of Sheba, one of the great queens of the world at that time, that she was so powerful. He brought her to Jerusalem to show her that his kingdom was far bigger than hers. And Allah sustained that. And as you can see, my dear sisters and my brothers, Suleiman or Solomon wasn't just a messenger of Allah. The, the, the children of Israel have had so many messengers. But Suleiman was a king with a special gift. And that gift, as I told you, the wind and everything, and a part, a part of that kingdom were the jinn. And the children of Israel always believed, and they still do believe, that Suleiman had the kingdom that he has because of the jinn and magic. And that Suleiman had a ring whenever he why whatever he did to that ring, moved it, wipe over it, just uh, dust it, undust it, something happens and he could preach magic. And they believe that in order for them to get the kingdom back, they need to do exactly as Suleiman did. And that is why to our days they speak uh, they always still speak about the kingdom of Suleiman and what he has accomplished. And that's why Allah said that they have thrown the Torah behind their back and completely ignore it. And they did that as if they didn't know that they are supposed to follow the Torah. So they completely ignore that. The thing is, when Allah issued this uh, statement about what they did, he said for them, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا And had they, the, the people of the, the Jewish people, had they protected themselves by believing in Allah and doing the good deeds, Allah would have rewarded them far, far better than what they are expecting. But they decided to disobey Allah, invent lies on Suleiman, deviate the people's attention, all this, to get what they want from it. Don't go to the Bible, I mean the Torah, or the Quran, stick with what Suleiman had, and we will have what he had. And this is really a very devilish manipulation that they use, and it is still used in today. There is a close relationship between us and the hidden world of the jinn, the shaitan and his uh, team, the, the, those who work with him, and they whisper to people who work with them. Sometimes you go to, uh, into an argument with someone who is so into my, in much in the party of a shaitan, and that person there seems eloquent in whatever they discuss with you. And you go, how did they come up with those ideas? Well, it really is simple. The shaitan whispers to these people. They don't possess them. And it's not magic, and it's not. But since a shaitan has the ability to whisper and do the waswas to the people who are not in the party of Allah, those who are in his party, he can use them to discuss and debate and challenge us to ideas. And this has been reported in the Quran. وَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ لَيُوحُونَ إِلَىٰ أَوْلِيَائِهِمْ And the shayateen, i.e. the jinn who are the devil, who work with shaitan, do indeed whisper to their associates or to their allies. So when the jinn whisper, why do they do that? Well, Allah says, so that they dispute with you. لِيُجَادِلُوكُمْ they challenge you, they debate you, they, they, they just keep nagging and disputing and arguing with you. And then Allah says, وَإِنْ أَطَعْتُمُهُمْ And if you are to obey them, i.e. those humans who are disputing and challenging and debating and arguing, if you obey them in what they tell you, and because what they say is not theirs, it's, it's under the influence of the whispers of the shaitan, Allah says, then إِنَّكُمْ لَمُشْرِكُونَ Then you become polytheists, associators with Allah. 
It's very, very delicate what goes on, my dear sisters and my brothers. It's not something easy to say. It's not something simple. Anyone who says I believe in magic is not saying, oh, uh, it's, it's a matter of belief or disbelief or shirk, association with Allah. That is why it's extremely, it's, it's extremely dangerous what people are doing. People, you find them, they come to you and, and they sacrifice and they do a lot of evil stuff and then they say, why is it happening to us? Well, guess what? Because you're not in the party of Allah. In the Bible, Allah has issued a statement to the children of Israel in the Torah. And this is in Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse from 9 all the way to 12. Look what Allah has revealed to the children of Israel, the Jews and Christians. He tells them this, when you enter, I'm quoting here from the Bible or the Torah, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and he's talking about what we call today Palestine, about the blessed land. And this statement is exactly, exist, it exists in the Quran with different wordings, but the meaning is the same. The Lord has given them. It says, when you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you. Do not learn to imitate the hateable ways of the nations there. The despicable ways of what people are doing there. Okay. Verse number 10. Let no one be found among you. And then they, it's going to produce a list of what Allah has forbidden in the Bible. Please pay attention because it's extremely important and you will understand why the rabbi and the preacher of the Jews disbelieve, why they are kuffar, and why anyone who does or believes in what they believe is also a kafir. Allah says in the, uh, in the Torah, in the Bible, let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire who practices divination or sorcery i.e. you try to find out the future that's what divination is interprets omens engages in witchcraft or casts spells or who is a medium i.e. between the live and dead people who claim to talk to the dead people or spiritists or who consults the dead anyone this is verse number 12 anyone who does these things is despicable to the Lord because of these same detestable practices the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you it's clear magic sorcery witchcraft interpreting almonds being a medium being a spiritist consulting the dead practice sorcery divination things like that are haram even in the Bible. And that's why when they abandoned the Bible, they threw it behind the, their backs and believed in the sorcery and magic and claimed that Suleiman had his kingdom because of magic, Allah qualified them as kuffar. And this is why anyone who believes in magic, believes in magic, that when you go to a magician, they will write a spell and call on the shaitan and they put a spell on you and then that spell is going to harm you you if you believe that you also are a kafir and i repeat it you are a kafir someone might say but i believe i do salat and i do that and i do this and I do that i am now will tell you you are just like someone who kills people doesn't do a lot of things but he just performs salat he steals money of the people he puts it like <laughs> like uh, some dictators uh, the, the, some people at the, gov at the head of the governments today in Muslim world he performs Salat when Ramadan comes in they fast and they do all that however they are the dictators that kill Muslims for no reason at all but they kill them because they're scared of them kill 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 but he performs his Salat and things like that you see what I mean it doesn't go like that what you claim to be and what you do, Allah takes what you do. Magic does not exist. The only one who can create something out of nothing is Allah. Magicians can't do. Look, I gave, I've given this example before, but I come back to it again. 
If I want, <laughs> if I want this woman that I love, my sweetheart of my youth is married to somebody, and I want to go back to her, I love her so much. All right, I go to a magician, and I will enter. Hello, in that setup and the house and incense and the lights and the the, the the skeletons there, the head of a dead person there, the way they dress, it creates all that vibe. And then I go there and I'm already totally submitted to him and I believe that he can provide the answer to me and he will take advantage of that. The moment I walk in there, what can I do for you? I go, I have a problem. I am madly in love with a girl and I want to marry her, but she's married. I want her to divorce her husband and me marrying her. He's going to ask me, what's her name? And I'm going to say her name is X. And the name of her mother is, I'm going to say A. And the name of the father, B. And where does she live in town C? So that's all he needs from me. And then he goes to me and you, and I give him my name, the name of my mom, and the name of my dad, and do this and do that. And then he will ask me, write with the left hand this, and do this and do that. And then he will scribble something on a piece of paper. And then he's going to give me a list of things to do. Perhaps get a, a black chicken and go to, uh, go to a graveyard that has, the person has died like three days ago. And then uh, whatever is going to give me, I'm going to dig a hole in that graveyard and put it in there. There are some people that ask for the hand of a dead person and people go to graveyards and they dig in, in the Muslim world. They dig in to get the hand of that, uh, the left hand of a dead. Why the left hand? Because the jinn love the left hand. And then this person is going to do that and then he's going to give me a piece of paper and he goes, okay, that's the spell, go dig, uh, dig it and put it in a graveyard and in a few days uh, she will divorce her husband and in the future you're going to get married to her, pay the bill. And then the mob, they, they take the money and I live with the spell. That is kufr. That is absolute kufr. That is absolute disbelief. No matter if after that I go pray door, or I am fasting in Ramadan, or the next day I go to Hajj. That is kufr. Because I have attributed something that only Allah has to a charlatan. And this is very, it's very strange. Now let me go back to that, uh, the, the, the two angels of Babylon. All Abrahamic branches of this Islam, since Ibrahim to here. And by the way, when Allah sent Muhammad, Muhammad did not bring a new version of Al Islam. Muhammad just took back to the original Islam of Abraham when it comes to beliefs. For the halal or haram, they are different. But for the beliefs, he just linked back, took us back to Ibrahim. And that's why the Quran orders Muhammad to follow in the religion of Ibrahim, to walk in the pathway of Abraham. We all know that Abraham didn't believe in magic. All right? And whatever he preached, what Allah reveals to him, there is no magic. And as such, the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran say there is no magic. So how come then people say that they can use it to separate two people between two husbands? I mean, husband and wife, wife and husband, that's what I mean. And this is a very disturbing and powerful question. If magic doesn't exist, why is Allah saying that they use it to separate between people, couples? And then he tells us that magic will not take effect if Allah does not authorize it. But then again, it raises another question. Why would Allah send angels from heaven and him descend the magic on them? and then teaching it to people, and then Allah doesn't let that magic take place. Our books, our scholars, they say, oh, that is to test people. But uh, isn't shaitan enough? Shaitan is our declared sworn enemy. Isn't he enough for our misguidance? So if we had to place magic, or the evil eye, or the envy, in the scales of good and evil, we all would agree that they go in the scale of evil, right? Nobody's going to say magic is, is good, it's halal. Everybody from the head until their toe would say that magic is haram. And it's true. Because in reality, there is nothing that takes place in magic.
the entertainment magic, the Las Vegas magic, the card games, and well, you know, the, 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 the magicians you pay to play tricks in front of your eyes, they go home and you go home, they know they just fooled you, but they, there is no magic. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the magic that affects people so that the husband goes home today, someone feeds him some food, and be <laughs> I've seen this before. I told before a few people, I don't believe in magic. Someone says, you sure? I said, of course. He goes, okay. They took a little bit of mine and I said, go and do a spell. They went actually to somebody. Seek them to put a spell. And then they came to me with a water and they asked me to drink it. My friends my, 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 they said, don't drink. I said, what's wrong with you? They go, no, you're going to, I said, what? My friends were scared that if I drank it, something might happen to me. And I was telling them at that moment, you are committing kufr and shirk. Stop it. Stop it. If you are scared for a split of a second that a conjurer might conjure up some magic for you to drink or eat or touch or do something, and something is going to happen to you. You actually are treating them as a god, not as a human being. Always remember, if Shaitan could magic me, could put a spell on me, why doesn't he go and put a spell on the entire humanity? Why does a Shaitan work on somebody for 15 years in hope that he would die and go to hellfire, and then that person repent to Allah and becomes a good person? Shaitan has lost 15 years of continuous energy. If shaitan had a guarantee for himself, he would put a spell on me and then he has me guaranteed for life. I'll never ever go back to Allah and sure way I'll go to hellfire. But shaitan knows he can't use magic. The jinn they know they cannot use magic. But the charlatans, they can sell you magic and you believe them at your own expense, at your own faith. So a magician is always working to earn a living. Always keep this in mind, please. And if magic did really exist, magicians would be the richest people on earth. Hey, they can out of nothing create tons of wealth. I walk into a room and I put a spell and minutes later that uh, room is filled with dollar bills. A hundred dollars bills, that's it. But all humans agree this doesn't happen. A magician's a magician, no matter where he is on earth, I'm talking the charlatan ones, wherever he is on earth is always in a working capacity. He always is there to make money. They always demand payment for their services. And this alone should have been an alarm to the magic seekers. Magicians really heavily rely on the vulnerabilities and weakness of the idiots who go and see them. So how can a magician sell his or her deceiving services to people, knowing that they don't have them? They offer, like Bob Dylan, he says, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. And this is exactly what the magician does. He's just blowing in the wind and it goes nowhere. Yet their tactics, as I said, they rely on the vulnerabilities and the weakness of people. Magicians always set the scene up. They prepare the environment. And the environment always works to maximize their success. The moment you enter their environment, it's not lit, it's dark. And there you find it decorated with different elements of dead corpses, scary nets of spiders, and the clothing is almost like 10 centuries ago. They put some strong aromas there and incense so that when you smell it, it affects your breathing, your thinking. It's almost like they are burning cannabis or marijuana for you. Well, once you get there, that's it. You become almost like a high. And perhaps they'll have a snake or a few frogs here or there, or maybe a mouse there and here running. And they will themselves will be dressed to plant fear in the heart of those weaklings of vulnerable people who go and seek their services. You get the idea. 
And then once you walk and you sit in front of them, they dominate you with their looks and the voice. And my sisters and my brothers, put it well in your head. Magicians work hard at impressing their customers. At the end of the day, you are a customer to them, nothing else. Yes, you heard it right. You are a customer. And because this is how a magician looks to you when you go in there, and when you walk there and he talks to you, he considers you as a customer, and a stupid customer at that. And that you are willing to pay lots of money for something that doesn't work. The magician knows it doesn't work. Eh, it's just like walking into a car dealership to buy an expensive car while knowing that it doesn't have an engine. But you fall for the decor and the way it looks, let's say. And then you pay lots of money and you take a carcass, but that is, you can't try it, you can do nothing of it. My dear sisters and my brothers, magicians spend a lot of time fine-tuning the way they talk to people. They make big promises while knowing all the while that they are just working at seducing the customer into giving them lots of money and they make sure that you come back to them for a follow-up two or three or four times. Everything works from the dark eyes they put on their, for their makeup, to the dark clothing they wear, to the way they talk. All this is an act of circus to create the right environment for you to fall under their lies. And then they make promises, promises, promises. They co will come up with all kinds of tricks of spells and even love or hate potions. They will charge a lot of money for them. Of course, if I am madly in love with my sweetheart who is married to somebody else and the magician has two potions for me, hate potions for her to take to hate her husband, a love potion for her to love me. And if he's going to sell me the hate potion, 1,000 pounds or dollar, and the love potion, 2,000 pounds, he's made 3,000 pounds in a setting of less than an hour. <laughs> It's incredible. My dear sisters and my brothers, we have to wake up. Their magic doesn't exist. So now let us go back a little bit in history. Remember when I told you about Musa and the magicians he met and everything? And when they met face to face and the magicians threw their stuff and the ropes, what did they do? Allah says the following And when they, the magicians, uh, or the Egyptian magician of the Pharaoh, and when they threw their staffs and ropes and everything, they bewitched the eyes of the people. Now you're going to say, how can they bewitch my eyes? They can do that. Okay, I'll tell you something. Yeah, Go online on YouTube and type this name. Shin Lim S H I N space Lim L for Lima I M. This is a young man who started doing magic seven years ago, back in time, maybe now it's 10 12, but it doesn't matter. This young man performs extremely incredible acts of entertainment magic, not real magic, entertainment magic. He does the impossible right in front of you. And, and you see nothing. That's the bewitching of the eyes. It's us seeing absolutely nothing of the trick they play. One day he went to Las Vegas in one of the big stages in Vegas. It's beautiful one once you get there. Pen and Teller, P-E-N-N and Teller, T-E-L-L-E-R, two of the finest entertainment magician on earth. They know every trick and uh, how it's done. They even have uh, magic boxes that you, they can sell for your kids. I bought my daughter one of these because she wanted to play with it. No problem, no harm in it. It's just tricks and she learns something on how to manipulate things. End of it. It was uh, an expensive purchase, I think 80 pounds. <laughs> she played a little bit with it and then I never saw it again. But hey, that's part of her education. Uh, ben and Teller sits there and they watch people perform their acts of magic. Anyone who fools them 
get a trophy and ten dollars uh, re uh, reward and then they get an exposure worldwide in the realm of magicians that's fine this Shin Lim fooled them twice with his tricks when you look at how he does his tricks you see absolutely nothing absolutely nothing he has the card in one hand and then he moves his hand quick and, and the card disappears completely disappears that's magic that's what Allah says they bewitched when he says they bewitched the eyes of people meaning they played their tricks and people had no clue how they affected what they affected and not only that because the magicians of the Pharaoh had a purpose and that is to eat and destroy what Musa, the, the snake of Musa. As soon as they played the trick, the people got fooled into thinking that what the magicians have done, they have created snakes. And that's why people start getting scared. And this is what Allah says. And they struck terror into the viewers, the Egyptians. And Allah Himself attests and acknowledges that they have come up with a great deal of magic not real magic but the entertainment magic they fooled people into thinking the difference between the magicians of the pharaoh and musa is that they played a magical trick to fool people Musa had a staff when he throws it it becomes a real snake his was not to fool people his was to do a job the magicians were to fool people and this is the difference between the two and that's why magic doesn't exist when you go to a charlatan who will pretend to do something for you they are not doing something for you they are just fooling you into taking your own money Allah gave them a good review. He said they came up with a good uh, trick. And that's why Allah trained Musa. The reason Allah spoke to Musa. Yeah, Allah didn't need to speak to Musa. But he spoke to him. Of course in a manner that befits Allah. But what Musa heard is what Allah had chosen to represent him. The voice that was used is what Allah had uh, accepted to represent him it's his it's not his it's none of my business i don't care about that all i care about is musa heard a voice he spoke and the allah answered him that's what matters to me when allah asked him and what is what what's that in your right hand moses musa said this is my stuff i lean on it and i beat down leaves for my sheep with you know the like uh, the shepherd when he walks and the, and the leaves are up in the tree the the animals the, the they can't go there the sheep can't go there so what he does he hits them so that the sheep eat from there he goes i do that and then moses said and i have other uses for it i walk for it i turn rocks with the things like that and allah tells him musa threw it and this is a conversation a conversation that took place a real life conversation and Musa throws it and the moment he throws it it turned into a snake Musa had no idea he didn't know before that Allah didn't tell him throw it and it will change into no Allah just said throw it because Allah wanted to create the element of surprise in Musa and the possibility that Musa will face the magicians so he won't be surprised and as soon as Musa throws the stuff, a piece of wood in his hand that he's been using maybe for years, and it turns into a snake, Musa in another ayah got very scared. And he ran away and he didn't even look back behind him. So Allah tells him, Ya Musa, come back here, don't be scared. The messengers don't get scared with me. All this is real life conversation between Allah and Musa. Then Allah orders Musa to the snake. He says, pick it up. <laughs> it's scary. Pick it up. Like, it's not, pick up. Yeah, it's a python. Just go ahead. Pick it up. And Musa, I want you to imagine Musa completely scared. The shock of his life happened that night. Talking to a god in a valley. It's in a dark valley. and It's, it's incredibly, it's, it's, it's life-changing experience for real. 
the moment Musa laid hand on that uh, animal, on the snake, on the big snake, it uh, it, it went back uh, to uh, to the staff, and that's why Allah said to him. قال خذها ولا تخف سنعيدها سيرتها الأولى. he said to him, Musa, take it and do not have fear. we we shall return it to how it was before. and Musa took that life uh, lesson and he went on. the story of Musa with the magicians of Pharaoh was told to us for a variety of things. one of them is that magic doesn't exist. it's a trick. That they play on people. And this is why when Allah wanted to train Musa. When, it, uh, when he told him throw down your stuff. And guess what? As soon as Musa throws that stuff. The dead stuff that he's been carrying in his right hand for God knows how many years. As soon as he throws it. He saw it shaking as though it was an agile snake. It, you know how the snake was? It was not going like, you know how the snake slid the right, left. No, this one was going up and down. It, it, it's almost like it was a bouncing. It was a ferocious snake. It was an angry snake. Musa, when he saw that, وَلَّا مُدْبِرًا وَلَا مُعَقَّبًا Musa turned and fled away. He's talking to a god. He completely forgot that he's in the presence of a god. He ran away. Allah had to call him, Musa! Yeah, Musa, come back here. Come forward and do not be scared. In my service, messengers do not fear. What a statement. What a statement. All this to show Musa that the only one who can create something out of nothing is Allah. Really. So the story of Musa and, and, and the story of Musa and the Pharaoh is such a beautiful story and I will leave it until the day inshallah I cover up the whole story of uh, the, the, uh, the prophets and I will go in details about the kingdom or what happened to Musa and things like that. But what interests us today is that Suleiman had asked of Allah a kingdom to give him a kingdom that no other will ever have access to that kingdom and it did happen. So now at the time of Muhammad when Quran was revealed down the people of Jew uh, the, the Jewish in al Madina, instead of believing in the Quran and the, in the messenger went ahead and turn their attention to what was revealed to Suleiman. Now, let me tell you, well, let's discuss now, the, let's go to the story of uh, the two um, entities, uh, Harut and Marut. Allah says, and they, the people of the book, followed what the shayateen, i.e. the corrupt rabbis, the priests, the leaders, and even the influences, or even the sheikhs, and things like that, what these shayateen spread upon the kingdom of Suleiman. Okay? So, what is it that they spread about Suleiman? The one thing that they spread about Suleiman that he was a magician. Suleiman was a magician. That's why he accomplished what he accomplished. They don't acknowledge that Allah gave him. They say that Suleiman was a magician. And let's not forget one thing as we speak about uh, uh, these creatures, the jinn. Always put in, in your head that the sh chief enemy, the chief enemy of everyone is a shaitan. A shaitan is the, is the head of every evil thing that happens on earth. A shaitan, the one who refused to yield to our father Adam, the one who promised to Allah that he will not rest until he drives all of us into hell fire. A shaitan hates us. A shaitan wants to hurt us. He wants to harm us. He wants to pain us for eternity. His sole purpose for existence today is to misguide us and ensure our interest into hellfire. Do you think this guy wouldn't use magic if he could? He would. But he can't because there is no such thing. And when Allah granted a human Suleiman an opportunity to control his kind, the kind of shaitan, a shaitan didn't appreciate it at all. How can Allah give a human being 
Suleiman, authority over the shayateen that work for me, and I can no longer use them because they are at the service of Suleiman. How does that happen? You see what I mean? A shaitan didn't have access to his own shayateen. Of course, you would think that he would like Suleiman. No, he would hate double Suleiman. He would want to harm him, hurt him, pain. He would want to do all the evil to him. You see, a shaitan could see that those miserable divine jinns who worked with him are all chained up and punished, and he can't do nothing to help them. How do you think a shaitan would feel about that? Being totally helpless and totally paralyzed, powerless, unable to do nothing to save them from their miserable fate. Suleiman has them at, in his hand, in his full grip. For once, humans had an upper hand and shaitan had the lower hand. Therefore, as soon as Suleiman died, a shaitan got to work him and his allies. And they started spreading all kinds of rumors against Suleiman and his kingdom. Suleiman didn't control the jinn because Allah has given him that ability. A shaitan made people believe through his whispers to them and to, to his allies that the way Suleiman controls the jinn was through magic. And the, if you want what Suleiman had, then you got to do what Suleiman did. And the only way to do that is to work with us and to work with us you gotta communicate with us. To communicate with us, you gotta do evil stuff. All the while knowing that a shaitan can absolutely do nothing for anyone who seeks his services. And that's why Allah innocented his messenger, Suleiman. Suleiman did not disbelieve. وَمَا كَفَرَ Suleiman, And Suleiman never blasphemed. But those who invent lies against him, those who say that Suleiman is a magician, these people are the disbelievers. Because Suleiman, no matter what he had, he always attributed to Allah. Suleiman, whatever he had, he always said, Hadha min fadli rabbi. This is of my Lord, graceful favors. And then he adds, Li so that I am tested if I am a thanker, I thank Allah, or I am a denier. To be a thanker, you attribute all those favors to, that happen to you to Allah, even though you have done them yourself. But Allah has helped you behind the scene and you don't know how he helped you. But he did help you. And to be a denier is not to acknowledge that Allah has laid down his favors upon you. And this was a big mistake that Qarun, one rich man at the time of uh, Musa and Firaun, who was extremely rich that the keys to his treasures, a bunch of strong men cannot carry them. These are the keys. I'm not talking about the rooms and what's inside it. But he made one mistake. He made one mistake, this Qarun. He said, إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ مِنْ عِنْدِي All this wealth, I have collected it because of my own knowledge, of my own ability. And you see how he removed Allah from the equation? Allah Ta'ala opened the earth and had it swallow him and his wealth. Everything went with there. Suleiman was not like this. So the thing is, for we have two elements. It's either you don't do magic, and you are not a kafir like Suleiman, or you do magic and you become a kafir. It's one or the other. It's 53 minutes. I'll stop here, inshallah, and carry on in the next uh, element, uh, part eight. And I pray to Allah to give us a little bit of uh, sabr, patience. We are at page 65, and uh, we almost have a few more pages, uh, maybe 10. Uh, hopefully, number eight will be the last one. Again, this is your brother Abdus Salam, and this is uh, the talk on magic, evil eye, and envy. Assalamu alaikum.